I'm David Clement. I'm executive director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. On behalf of SPC President Tanja Williams and Seminole Campus Provost Mark Strickland, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Seminole Campus of St. Petersburg College. I want to thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoyed your dinner as much as I did mine. Can we acknowledge the caterer, Nature's Table? Very, very good meal. <clears throat> and while we are recognizing folks, I'd like to acknowledge our media co-sponsors, the Tampa Bay Times and WEDU Television. May we have a round of applause for them? <clears throat> And I'd like to extend a special welcome to our guests from the uh, Osher Institute for Lifelong Learning at Eckerd College. We are pleased that the Institute has selected this as one of its seasonal programs on their fall calendar. Uh, Eckerd folks, can you just raise your hand? You don't have to stand. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And one more acknowledgement, the Student Government Association of the Seminole Campus has sponsored student seats here so that our students are able to come without charge. Thank you, Student Government Association. <clears throat> Tonight's program is presented by the institute that I had, the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, which is based here at Seminole, <clears throat> but serves the entire uh, St. Pete College system of 12 campuses, but also we have a mission to serve the entire Florida college system of 27 colleges across the state. I hope that this program exceeds your expectations as that is the standards that guides all of our efforts to provide a quality education for anyone seeking a career enhancing degree or certificate. The Institute is now in its eighth year of providing these kinds of thoughtful programs on the most important issues of the day. And what is more interesting or provocative than tonight's topic? The term fake news seems to be everywhere, and it seems to have taken a life on a life of its own in the last couple of years. Just since I started considering it as a topic, in the spring, it has evolved into a force that affects elections around the world, motivates dictators to suppress dissent and shut down news outlets, demeans our most respected institutions, and divides our country like nothing that I've seen since the Vietnam War over 50 years ago. The topic is almost too big to take in in one evening, but we're going to make an effort. We have brought together four perspectives on the issue, each hopefully adding something to our understanding of it and our ability to confront it. Once all the speakers have made their opening presentations, we'll have extended conversation here with me and them, and then we'll take your questions. At this point, however, I need to make one program change. You'll see in your program there are four speakers listed. Unfortunately, one of them came up sick this afternoon and was able to uh, make it. Ms. Hewitt uh, Hailu of Pointer uh, is not here. But substituting, well, actually uh, filling in for her uh, is our opening speaker, who is a colleague of hers at Pointer Institute. And he has agreed to wear two hats tonight. As you can see from the bio in your program, he is very well credentialed to do both. He is a, uh, Mr. Ale Alexios Mansarlis is a faculty member at the Pointer Institute and director of the International Fact Checking Network. He is also part of the European Union's high level group on fake news and online disinformation and he even wrote the lesson plan on fact-checking for UNESCO. Please welcome Mr. Alexios Metzorlis. All right, how are we all doing? Good. I uh, did not know I had to bring hats, 
So I am hatless, but I hope uh, you will be with me nonetheless. So I was going to start with um, yesterday's news that uh, the British government decided to ban the use of the term fake news in official government documents. Um, but today's news is just as relevant. Um, as soon as uh, news broke that uh, pipe bombs were sent um, to uh, prominent officials and meteorizations across the country, a concerted campaign to frame uh, this news, these very real pipe bombs, as a false flag uh, organized in messaging boards like uh, 4chan and spread way, way beyond. This is, unfortunately and tragically, our new normal. As soon as a piece of breaking news emerges, whatever it relates to, uh, misinformation surrounds it. Uh, misinformation pollutes our collective understanding of what the hell is actually going on. This is the problem uh, we're talking about today. So uh, back to the Brits. Um, I'm pretty agnostic about word use, uh, as long as people know what they mean, uh, which is often, too often, not the case with the word fake news. Uh, but I do think their move is, uh, is important and a big deal. A parliamentary committee of a major global power that is investigating the effect of misinformation in a country that has seen a messy historical referendum fought over very public false claims and a foreign intelligence ref um, attack on their soil shrouded in foreign disinformation. Uh, this country decided we should abandon the term because it's so grossly misused. So let's start this couple of hours together making sure that we all agree and understand what the term means. In late uh, 2015 and early 2016, uh, a bunch of us researching this space found that barely known websites uh, that had amassed huge Facebook followings were reaching uh, enormous audiences with entirely fabricated stories. They were hijacking the Facebook algorithm's propensity to, to highlight emotional and eye-grabbing content that was getting lots of reactions to bring traffic to their websites, and with traffic came ad revenue. This is different from smears or false information disseminated for political rather than financial purposes. That is more properly termed disinformation or propaganda, uh, and it is as old as humankind. At the same time, even fake news as properly defined, is not an entirely new phenomenon. Genuine meteorizations have been culpable of clickbait headlines for as long as the internet has been around, and more fittingly still, the penny press in this country was built on fake news, right? Uh, many of you will know this story, it was even on one of the slides, but in 1835, the New York Sun ran a six-part installment claiming all kinds of fantastic creatures, including the man bat, uh, had been discovered on the moon. Uh, fact check, uh, they had not. <laughs> but the sun used the clamor provoked by the story to reach what some historians think was the widest circulation rate for a newspaper on the planet at that time. Now, that circulation was 19,000 copies, which should, <laughs> from the laughter, as I understand, uh, you, you're with me on this, hints at one of the major things that is different today. Scale, right? Today's viral hoax has reached millions in a fraction of the time that it took the sun to run the first installment of their great moon hoax. So n fake news, not a new phenomenon at scale is. It's also not true that it is entirely new for an epithet like fake news to be appropriated and weaponized in the way that we are seeing these days, to attack opinions uh, that disagree with yours, to attack difficult criticisms. Lügenpresse, lying press, was used by Hitler and his acolytes to put down critics of the Nazi movement. There is historical precedent, and we should be informed by it. Still, this combination of increasingly brazen falsehoods on the campaign trails, the demise of the gatekeeping role of traditional media, and the explosion of viral misinformation is unique and dangerous. Three intertwined factors have played, uh, in my opinion, a major role in getting us where we are today. Uh, they are the three T's. Uh, technology, trust, and Trump-like political speech. I'll take the most controversial things first, <laughs> as I heard already some rumbling in the hall. Um, politicians long before Trump have repeated false or misleading claims. 
to drill them into public discourse and fire up supporters. I come from Italy. Um, we have a, had a few. Um, <laughs> to use a concrete example, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, who was also a media savvy, wealthy businessman turned politician, campaigned in 2013 on the abolition of the property tax by repeatedly suggesting that Italy's rate of home ownership was far higher than the rest of Europe. It was not. But this was meant to serve as a factual underpinning for his policy proposal. The goal for Berlusconi was ultimately to make his misleading claim sound believable. Trumpian discourse, and again, I use it as an adjective because it's not unique to him. In Trumpian discourse, the believability of, his, of facts is secondary often. During the campaign, uh, Donald Trump repeatedly claimed that unemployment figures provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics were totally phony and fake variously claiming that the unemployment rate was 18 to 20%, 24%, 32%, 35%, 40 and 42%, all actual claims. Yet in office, as soon as he got into office, he told Sean Spicer to inform reporters that they may have been phony in the past, but it's very real now. Because of course, unemployment rates now are at a historical low. So he also flipped dramatically on birtherism. This is a um, uh, an attitude to facts that doesn't necessarily care about you believing the specific fact, but about sowing doubt in all facts. And it's incredibly more dangerous. This is not an approach, again, that is unique to Trump for what it's worth, but as one of the mo world's most powerful individuals, I think it's more than fair for me to use him as an example. Moving on to the second T, trust. Facts are by definition an empirical thing. They can be measured, detected, or asserted to prove their existence. Still, in our everyday life, we trust that sources of facts have done their work rather than empirically reevaluate everything. We don't ask for someone's passport when they tell us their name. We don't go to a lab to determine whether the store-bought water bottle actually contains H2O. This same bond of trust has tied or needs to tie media outlets, information providers, and their audiences. Readers or viewers can't reach out to a story's sources each and every time to independently verify its truthfulness. We have, generally speaking, accepted the truthfulness of what's reported unless proven otherwise. But that bond has broken down for all kinds of reasons, including many reasons that the journalism and the media are to blame on. But now, sometimes readers may try to investigate things of their own accord. Sometimes for good, there's great citizen journalism, sometimes for really, really bad, as when a gunman showed up to a DC pizza parlor to investigate a conspiracy theory. But most are probably just going to operate on the basis of constant cynicism about what we read. The bond of trust is under severe stress. The final T is tech. I don't want to get too far into this because I know it's something John will talk about, but in broad strokes, Facebook and Google's original mission statement promised a richer information ecosystem. In many ways, that promise was not broken. We all have access to a lot more information than we ever did before. At the same time, however, their incentive structure has meant that new forms of misinformation um, can take advantage of their propensity to surface what is popular, regardless of what is true. Boosting ad revenue is their ultimate goal, and that will always trump weaker commitments to building an information marketplace optimized for accuracy. Now, both platforms have made a lot of changes and we can talk about that later. Our organization has partnered with them as well. Um, Facebook, for instance, opened up a dashboard for fact-checking organizations it partners with. Um, Google is highlighting fact-checks so that users can see the rating of a claim in search results. But uh, these platforms and the platforms that will come after them need to be structured in a different way, need to be structured in a way that helps us reach uh, verifiable information more easily. Right now, they have been very effective at providing fuel to our confirmation bias and to reinforce the sense that there are so many different truths out there that it's well nigh impossible to find an undisputed fact. The impact of all this is to reduce our shared understanding of reality. We are either paralyzed into inaction or divided into tribal politics uh, by the challenge of false news. Now, I want to <laughs> close and wrap up by uh, avoiding the impression that I think all is lost. I really don't. 
Um, I made a pretty long uh, pessimistic uh, entrance to this, but uh, I did like the term fake news much less than I did like the other popular neologism in, in tonight's uh, title, which is post-fact. I think the term post-fact really is more about liberal anxiety about phenomena they didn't predict uh, than about a genuine abandonment of facts either in politics or in the public space. I think it often is a way to explain away uh, populist movements uh, that uh, editorialists didn't predict uh, than to really define what's going on. Um, I'll give you a few uh, pieces of evidence because I am a fact checker after all. Um, there have been half a dozen at least in the past few months studies that have found consistently um, that when fact-checked, people's uh, understanding uh, moves towards the correct one, right? So regardless of your partisan belief, if you are told um, that something was found to be false, on average, people move towards the correct understanding. Not everyone, and we know who that not everyone is. Uh, and sometimes we are that not everyone, and that's an important component of being ready to uh, move on. The way I think we can move on is uh, to measure, engage, and commit. Measuring means doing a lot more research on how misinformation spreads, on what makes us trust or not trust information, and what makes for real incentives for our information producers, whether it is the media or social platforms, to put accuracy at the top of their agenda. Engaging and committing is something that both journalists and their audiences need to do. Uh, journalists need to listen to their audience qualms, to their complaints. They need to fact check more and they need to correct more promptly. Um, but there is a role for the public too. Uh, how many of you are on Facebook? Hands up. All right, so a lot of you. A lot of you are publishers. A lot of you are disseminators of information. A lot of you are small media organizations that share and produce content uh, to an audience that trusts you. How many of you know how to reverse search an image? All right, couple hands, good. Um, for the rest of you, reverse searching an image is, uh, if you are on Chrome, as simple as a right click away. If you right click on an image, you can see if it has been used in the past in other instances. So if there's a breaking news situation and you see an image going viral and you're like, oh my God, this, this thing is crazy, let me share it again. Take that one moment before you share uh, to see if it's b been already used in the past. If it's already been used in the past, it's highly unlikely that it's from that breaking news situation. This is one really small and almost stupid example of how we can all be a part of the solution and how we must all be a part of the solution. So I think there's a commitment to be made uh, in this difficult moment for uh, the public uh, and the media to commit to one another. It means that the media needs to commit to correct more promptly, to fact check more, um, to really root out sloppy mistakes from its reporting. At the same time, the public needs to recognize that corrections are the noblest format, the noblest uh, uh, tradition of American journalism, right? That if uh, a which other business routinely publishes somewhere all the mistakes it's made, right? This is an exceptional, uh, exceptionally important part of a healthy media ecosystem. And I'm concerned that in the confusion about what fake news is, often people attack those who correct themselves rather than uh, honor and recognize them. So if we want a healthy information ecosystem, if we want to be able to figure out what the hell is going out there, um, we all need to take our part. Teachers, media organizations, scientific institutions, the public. Thank you for being here tonight, as I think this type of exchange is one of many steps forward. I'm gonna shut up because I actually want to do Q and A's at the end. So I'll give all the rest of my time to that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexios, uh, and we'll get into hopefully more depth on some of his points when we have our discussion. Now let's go, though, into a little more technical aspect. I've asked Dr. John Duff, the chair of St. Petersburg College's College of Computer and Information Technology, 
to tell us how fake news gets started and how it spreads, just to walk us through the process on the internet. Dr. Duff. You guys have some uh, slides uh, that you can bring up for me. Thank you. Uh, well, it's great to be here tonight, and I was thrilled to see the Ollie folks here. Uh, I don't know if I know many of you, but I was at Eckerd College for 20 years, and I was uh, the director of IT there for the 10 years I've been at SPC for one year. Uh, and so I've made the switch from the operational side to the academic side, and the difference is my phone doesn't ring much anymore, which is... <laughs> which makes my wife uh, very happy as well. But we're going to talk about technology uh, in this fake news world, and so I want to just start by letting you know that everything I say is true uh, tonight. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can make this work. Technology, you know, it's always iffy. Uh, but when, when I think about technology in this context, I think of it in, as, as maybe th in three ways. Uh, one way that technology impacts this fake news world is it's a, it's a delivery system, right? We're very, we've created a very fast, efficient system of delivering fake news or any news or information to us. Um, it's also, as I see it, it's a, I, I, I'm using the term, it's a force multiplier. It amplifies a message, and we'll, we'll look at that in a bit here. And then this idea of creation. Do, does, is technology creating fake news? Uh, we reach that point where technology is actually creating uh, fake information or false information. We'll see. You know, as Alexio said, uh, you know, one of the fundamental characteristics of the web 2.0 or 2.x, whatever it is now, is the good news is that, you know, if, that users create the content. I think he referred to everyone as being kind of their own little media uh, empire. Uh, we create the content. That's the good news. But it also can be the bad news because lots of people are generating content that's being shared uh, efficiently and quickly. And you've seen this quote. It would be really nice if Mark Twain said this. He really didn't, I don't believe. The point, though, that, that I'd make here is that uh, this quote was probably, uh, probably offered uh, prior to the internet. And so uh, if that was thinking prior to the internet, then uh, you know, bad news travels very quickly, with or without. Uh, this is a, a tweet that, that uh, Walt uh, Mossberg retweeted when he was at a conference. Uh, that basically reinforces the point and says that, you know, basically bad news seems to travel faster than good news. Um, that's a little bit disturbing, isn't it? Uh, that that, that uh, true stories take about six times as long to reach 1,500 people. Uh, he was the, edit, uh, I believe, the technology editor of the Wall Street Journal for, for a number of years, and I, I think he's moved on to something else now. But uh, that's kind of a disturbing trend. So uh, do, we have, do we blame technology for this? Uh, I, isn't this a, is this a human problem? You know, are you going to blame us, you know, technical folks for this? Well, to some extent, it's a, it, it obviously is a human issue, but I think technology has certainly played a role. Uh, we've created this, uh, a number of platforms. How many do you think exist out there? How many social media platforms can you name? You know, I can bring a few of them in here, and you can see some of the common platforms. We tend to think of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. There are at least 60. This is just a small subset of platforms. Uh, I don't know what uh, your children and grandchildren are using, but it's probably they've moved on from Facebook and other sites, and they're using Snapchat and others that, that exist out there. So th there are lots of platforms. We've done a pretty good job of creating these delivery mechanisms. And oh, by the way, not only have we created these platforms, but we've created these. So if I want to get a message to all of you right now, I can do it. And I can get it to you at 2 a.m. as well, and it's going to reach you directly. You don't have to turn on the TV. You don't have to turn on the radio. It's going to be delivered right to your, to your pocket or your, uh, 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 nearby to you. Um, so we've got this reach anywhere, reach anyone, anytime. You know, I'm glad I didn't start my career in that world. <laughs> um, uh, it would be tough, I feel, for my, my children sometimes. Uh, as, as was stated earlier, the Internet's really an influence-based economy. Um, the, the ecosystem is based on popularity. Google's original algorithms were based 
loosely on an on a academic citation model. You publish a paper, and the more citations that that, the more times that paper is cited by other papers would be an indication of the value of that, that paper. Well, that was kind of the thinking behind the original page rank algorithm. But, uh, and it's not really a new concept. You know, popularity uh, isn't a new concept. We pay more for a Super Bowl ad than we pay for one on, on local news, certainly. Uh, but what we've done with, with technology has enabled us to monetize this in a, in a significant way. And so we've monetized popularity or the illusion of popularity. Uh, as it turns out, we can buy it. Uh, it was kind of news to me, but um, I'd ask you to do this right now, but I've decided not to do it. Uh, I would ask you to Google, how much does it cost to buy 1,000 likes on Facebook? or a thousand followers on Twitter. I've been doing those kind of searches, and I think Google has, uh, I got a message that they uh, flagged me as uh, having suspicious activity. Uh, so they've done something to tweak an algorithm to, to, to look. So I don't want that to happen to any of you, but I've had to click a box to move on on occasion because I was doing it. But it turns out you can buy a thousand uh, Twitter followers for about $18. You could buy a thousand likes for, uh, for a, about $15 at one point in time. Um, I haven't done the search in a few months uh, 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 because they're on to me, uh, I suppose. But uh, who would do that? Who would buy likes? That sounds desperate, desperate, doesn't it? Who would do it? Yeah, well, anyone who's trying to influence others would do it, right? And as it turns out, there are some celebrities who were shocked, shocked to discover they didn't have as many followers as they thought they had. <laughs> So it turns out their publicists found that they could buy popularity, and it wasn't that expensive, and so they did it. In fact, there's a company in Florida, uh, D-E-V-U-M-I, -E Devumi, that uh, was, is in this business, and you can buy, uh, you can buy popularity these days. Um, and there was a slide uh, earlier as well that, um, uh, that was that was playing in in the, in the uh, during the, the time that we were eating that that cited this. Uh, there was an 18 year old in in uh, Macedonia who actually created 100 sites. He bought 200 bogus Facebook accounts. You can actually buy accounts as well, uh, and he constantly liked, retweeted, and and linked to, uh, among these sites. He did a lot of work and and basically generated enough traffic to be rewarded. Google's AdSense program paid him for all the traffic he was generating. It's mostly him. As it turned out, he didn't really care about the content. It just happened that content related to our presidential election was popular, and the, kind of the, the faker, is that all right? Is that, the more fake, the better. And so he'd post all this content, and then he would go out and generate traffic, a lot of the traffic himself, and he made a lot of money. He made 16000 in a few months in a, in a country where the average monthly income is about $375. Google eventually shut him down, but it gives you an idea of what, what could happen. He, he took advantage of the opportunity. He's an 18-year-old has a lot of time on his hand. He dropped out of high school. Who would blame him? To, to, because he found he, he was onto a, a, an enterprise that was lucrative. Uh, he was, his account wasn't suspended, but you know, all, we don't have that kind of time on our hands. So surely technology can help us in this area and, 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 and improve our efficiency. And so what if we could automate that process? And it turns out we can. We can generate a lot of traffic using technology. And one of those ways to do it, we'll talk about a couple of them, but one way to, we do that is with a bot. Now, you've heard of bots. Uh, bots make, this make it relatively easy to generate or amplify traffic, I should say. Um, and you've, you've, they're, they're not a new thing. Um, you've used a lot of these. You've maybe used Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, uh, or maybe even Google News might be considered a bot. They're just a piece of software that, that handles a routine task for us. And here's some examples. You know, we may have a, a bot that we'd call a scheduling bot or a scheduled bot that would, you know, like the Big Ben bot that, you know, when the time of day equals one, it tweets bong, you know, or some message to you. Another one might be a watcher bot that looks, say, in this case, for an earthquake in San Francisco. If that happens, it tweets a summary. When there's an earthquake, boom, tweets a summary. But then we have these other bots that may be, we call them amplification bots, anonymous amplification bots that would uh, say when a political figure or a selected account or a celebrity like David would tweet, retweet. What if I have a thousand of these that are looking at David's account when he 
he tweets, boom, we all retweet. Well, suddenly one tweet gets amplified uh, significantly. Um, it's kind of a repeater. You know, I grew up in the Bell system and AT&T back in the analog days, and we had repeaters on the line. It reminds me a little bit of that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, do they work? Well, I think the answer is yes. Uh, and probably did a study that, that showed that, f they, they suggested that 52% over half of web traffic is bot generated. That's a, that's a big number, right? Uh, Twitter suggested that they had 50,000, over 50,000 bots that were linked to the IRA, which is the uh, Internet Research Agency in Russia, uh, that were tweeting about our last election. So do they work? The answer, is, I would say, is yes. They are very good at amplifying traffic. Closely related to, to bots is this idea of fake accounts. You know, the New York Times suggested that there were 2,700 fake Facebook accounts linked to the IRA with 80,000 posts that reached 127 million people during the last election cycle. I think that's about as many as voted, right? That's pretty close. Um, and um, the, uh, as it turned out, it had been very easy to create fake accounts. You could buy them. Uh, but it was also fairly easy to, to create fake accounts. Now, Google and Facebook and Twitter and others have, have, um, have made this process a little tougher, but it all comes down to authentication. How do I know you are who you say you are? How do I know who you are when you buy something on Amazon? How does Amazon know who you are? We've got this process in the cyber world of authentication. How do we authenticate? It turns out Amazon doesn't really care so much as long as you know the zip code that's associated with that credit card. <laughs> uh, but there's some things going on behind the scenes that allows your browser to authenticate who Amazon is. But that's, it's essentially a problem of, of, of authentication. Um, there was something like 48 million fake Twitter accounts, 15% of their, their accounts. In November of 17, uh, Facebook had to admit that they had uh, two times as many fake accounts as was previously disclosed. And that turned out to be about 60 million fake accounts. Um, we're not going to, it's a little bit beyond our scope right at the moment to discuss how you would create fake accounts, but it, it obviously had, had been done with great success. And there were even tools out there that would let you create, automate the process of creating fake accounts. You can look at those on, you can find those on uh, YouTube actually, as a matter of fact. Um, so fake accounts are a problem, and, and that's that's an artifact of, of, of how the problems were, the platforms were created and the issue of authentication as well. It's a difficult thing to do uh, without making it too onerous on the, on the users. You want to grow your user community, not restrict it. Uh, another way that, that is beyond even Facebook and, and Twitter is, is another exploit that occurred to amplify uh, traffic was a, a Facebook extent, or a, yeah, a Facebook, a browser extension that, that, that linked to Facebook, and it, it, it purported to share, um, give you a way to, sh to, to share and listen to music while you're on Facebook. Well, what this thing did, though, in the user agreement was that it allowed, you were giving permission to the app to access all of your friends and to message all of your friends. So if I downloaded this app and installed it, suddenly all my friends could get messages from me that this is a great app. They might all download and install it. Then we'd get all of their friends in our network so we could create a network. The thing is, this worked. And it worked so well that people complained. Why are all my friends getting these messages? And so it actually got, got uh, yanked as a result. But things like this happen. You can create a, a network very quickly of folks that you can then attempt to influence. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Albright uh, did some research on this. He looked at 117 websites that he thought were related to fake or false news. Um, and he, he grabbed, uh, he's a very persistent uh, person, he grabbed 750,000 links from those sites and he started to analyze those. And what he did was come to, I don't expect you'd be able to, uh, to, to really make sense out of that, that image. I just like, think it was kind of cool. But what that image showed us that, there, that uh, these links had, 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 there were links that, that, um, that, that were extending across the internet. And if you wandered into one of these sites, their tracking tools would track you. And then as you moved to be out around in the internet, surf the internet, it would begin to serve you others' sites from in that network. So it would attempt to influence you. So it was a little bit like, like flypaper. It was kind of a, uh, an influence network. He called it the uh, a micro propaganda machine. 
that would grab you, track you, and then begin to try to influence you by linking you to these various sites. Uh, it was very, very fascinating um, to see. But, so I think we can agree that technology has created a, a, a very efficient delivery mechanism and that we have provided uh, a way to amplify the message. We can take one tweet and turn it into to thousands and thousands of tweets. But are we create, is technology creating fake news? Um, I'm not sure if I can do this from here, guys. Um, let's see. No. I need to click on that image and launch it. There you go. Thanks. Have you seen this? Pretty cool, huh? Is it real? I hope not. You know, I hope if I'm on that plane, I hope it's not. Or if, it, or if it is, I hope he did land it. Well, you know, the thing is, 14 million people shared that. Uh, that like that. That was. Uh, and and the the thing about it that, that made it uh, interesting is that some of those people probably thought it was real. And one of the reasons they thought it was real is that there truly was an emergency landing that day. And this image was captioned with the actual event. It did occur on August 28th at, at Sestran uh, China Airport. There was an emergency landing, and people posted this, hey, this is what happened. And so it was linked to a real event. So it's sort of a little bit tempting to believe it could have happened. But um, yeah, they, they don't do a barrel rolls in whatever that is, 737, I don't think. But the point is, you know, a, a director, uh, a graphics artist and director in LA had created that image, and he didn't even know it had been used. But it looks real, doesn't it? And that's one of the problems. Now, it's very difficult to detect whether an image is actually real, or a video in this case. I'm going to show you one more. And we're not going to click this one, guys. We're just going to show it to you. And I'm not going to show it to you because I don't know if has anyone seen this one. It's a, it's a story where um, actually it appears to be President Obama doing a talking. And uh, this was him talking, I guess, uh, talking and, and, and uh, sharing a public service announcement. And, it starts normally enough, and then it sort of gets a little weird. And I'm not going to play it because there's some colorful language. And then about halfway through, the picture splits, and you see that it's Jordan Peele who's actually talking, sounding like Obama, and his, Obama's face is moving as, as Jordan Peele speaks. So use of some technology and AI to actually create something that looked incredibly realistic. But if you, you would not know that it was not uh, 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 the president speaking. You can, you can search this on YouTube and you'd find it. Um, so again, is technology being used to create fake news? Uh, it's really a, um, a human element to those two examples. But uh, I'll wrap it up by saying you know, there is a tool that's being used by some news organizations called Heliograph that actually does generate news. It can do things like, as I understand it, and I, I'm certainly far from an expert on, th on, on this, but. Uh, as I understand it, it can take, say, a, a box score from a baseball game and, and look at the, the statistics there and generate a, a, a basically a news story and say, hey, you know, John was up four times, got two hits. Uh, so and so, you know, David, David was the winning uh, pitcher, those kinds of things. And they've used it to actually generate stories so that they wouldn't assign a reporter to do. Uh, that's the extent of my understanding, but my point is that this is something that's being used to generate news, so could it be, you know, used for, uh, for uh, malicious purposes? Maybe. Um, can we do anything about it? We'll talk more about this, I'm sure, in the Q&A sessions, but, uh, you know, is it, is it self-regulation? Can we trust Facebook? and Twitter and other social media platforms to police themselves. You know, to their credit, they're, they're stepping up a bit and trying, right? Uh, they're making it a little tougher to, be, to set up an account. They're, 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 they're making the authentication process a little bit tighter. They've tried, they're trying to be more transparent. Um, they're working apparently with the Pointer Institute and, uh, and others. Uh, Facebook now tells us who paid for a political ad. Maybe tough to track down who paid the people who paid for the ad, but uh, they're doing that. They're creating a database of political ads that, uh, that an archive, so to speak, that we can look at. Um, Firefox is offering a, a, an election bundle. Anybody using that? The election bundle uh, essentially 
does a, like an incognito mode as you as you uh, spent time on Facebook so that Facebook can't track what you're looking at, and it also gives you access to a database of, of ads. Do we look to, to legislative solutions to this problem? Europe seems to be moving that way in some respects, especially with respect to privacy. Um, uh, will we follow that? California, there's been some legislation proposed that would that would suggest that every bot needed to have a human associated with it. Hasn't gone anywhere yet, but that's been discussed um, a little bit. Um, you know, as it turns out, probably the best, uh, what's the best technology to detect fake news? You and us, right? Uh, Facebook has hired an incredible number of people to man their war room to, to analyze fake news. Algorithm news algorithms are very good at uh, detecting when something is uh, appropriated or stolen. We can, we can protect intellectual property rights. We're pretty good at that, but determining whether something is true or not is really tough to do algorithmically. They are looking at comments and, and trying to, 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 to approach that question in a programmatic way, but, um, but it's a challenge. And so they're using, they've hired a lot of people to take on that task. At the end of the day, um, you know, if you see a plane do a barrel roll, be skeptical. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, John. And hopefully we can get a little bit more into some technology issues in a few minutes. But let's uh, take another perspective on uh, this issue. And to do that, um, I have, would like to call upon Mr. Chris Ingram. He is a political commentator and president of 411 Communications, who has a talk radio show weekdays uh, in the mornings in Tampa. Mr. Ingram. I would like to say, please don't call me Mr. Ingram, because that's my dad. Makes me feel old. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, yeah, in addition to the um, talk radio show that I do on AM820 News, I'm also the political analyst at Bay News 9. I've been doing that for about eight years now. And I used to write a column for the Tampa Tribune on politics weekly. And for a brief time, I wrote for the Tampa Bay Times. <clears throat> um, I also have my master's degree in journalism that I got from uh, University of South Florida, and I'm a member of the Honor Society there for journalism, which is a group called KTA. And the KTA have an important meaning. They stand for knowledge, truth, and accuracy. And so when I was asked uh, to participate in this, I, I was thinking about KTA and what is fake news was one of the things that I was asked to expand upon from a, a conservative perspective. <clears throat> and I tell you, um, I don't know what it is. You know, Justice, Potter Stewart once said, talking about uh, pornography, I don't know what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> Fake news is kind of the same way. You know, you, you don't really know exactly what it is, but you know it when you see it. It is a, a very subjective term. I, I know that Alexios and uh, his group, they try to define it, but I, I think that we all could agree, correct me if I'm wrong, Alexios, that it is a, still a subjective term. And we need to be cognizant of that uh, as citizens and individuals, certainly the media has a role in, in trying to uh, do better. And, you know, President Trump has certainly added a little bit of uh, element of fuel to the fire as to what fake news is. I think fake news means something to President Trump that is not necessarily what it means to me, might not be what it means to you. But there are certainly people that, that believe when President Trump talks about the mainstream media that it is all just fake. There are actually people out there that believe it. And I think that it's important for the, the news media and the profession of journalism, which I'm a member of, to do a better job of providing good news, real news, news that's based on uh, those things TKA, TKA stands for, truth, knowledge, and accuracy. Because a lot of times, the, the media that we see on television, that we read in newspapers and online in legitimate news sources, they don't get the story right. They don't do it right. They don't do it well. And that leads to people to question what they're saying. And, <clears throat> you know, I think one of the more recent phenomenon that is really kind of plaguing what a lot of people consider the media and journalism to be is 
the issue of opinion, you know, like what I do on my radio show, what I do or what I did for the Tampa Tribune. But I was, I was paid to write columns that were my opinion. As a radio show host, people know that I am there to give my opinion. But too often today, when you turn on the television, and it doesn't matter what network it is, we all have our preferences that we gravitate toward, you know, Fox, MSNBC, CNBC, CNN, whatever, OAN, uh, BBC, what have you. But pr primarily, at least the American uh, cable TV news channels and also the Alphabet Networks and their programming, they give way too much opinion. Way too much opinion. And there's a reason for that. And it is leading, the, the cause of it is, is leading people to not trust the news media. And the reason why the news media is doing it is very simple. It's, it's simple economics. Does anybody have any guess on what it is? Why do we see the proliferation of so much opinion on television today? Yes, sir. Which is what? Okay. So he said a silo that's a, they're trying to attract her to a particular model, uh, a de dem demography, a demographic group. Yes, sir. Yeah, attention span seven seconds. That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I don't want to take any more questions, but that, that, that I appreciate those. They're all very good answers. But the, the actual reason why they do it is very plain and simple. Opinion is cheap and news gathering is very expensive. It costs next to nothing comparatively to hire. I've been one of them. I used to do a lot of punditry when I was in Washington, D.C. for Fox and CNN and MSNBC. I've done them all. And it's very cheap to get some cat like me to get an opportunity to have his mug on television and post on Facebook, hey, look at me and how smart I and wonderful I am. Uh, we're real cheap. Get them up there and give an opinion. But to actually do news gathering, I'm talking about television in this instance, to do news gathering to fill that same six or seven minutes of time that I might spend on air talking to Bill O'Reilly or whoever else about whatever nonsense is going on in Washington today, it's peanuts. I mean, we're talking hundreds of dollars compared to tens of thousands of dollars to actually do a news story, to do real news investigative type uh, reporting. And so... You know, I think that it's real convenient to blame this whole phenomenon of fake news on President Trump. And I have my issues with the president, but it's not his fault. As has been acknowledged here already today, this is a phenomenon that has been going on for a long time. And it'll continue to go on uh, until such time as the media starts to look at itself and to do a better job. And let me tell you something. Day-to-day -day journalists, as well as the leadership of local newspapers that I've talked to, they don't get it. They don't see the fault in the, their own product. They're very proud people of the work that they do, and I'm not saying that it's, it's bad product, but they, they fail to recognize that it can be improved, that they could do a better job, that the objectivity that is oftentimes in question, that there are ways to overcome that. And whether you're conservative, or Republican, or liberal, or Democrat, or progressive, or whatever else in between, I think most of us can objectively look at a television news program or a written news story, and we can see bias. We can see lack of objectivity in that reporting a lot of times. Now, I don't want to pick on the Tampa Bay Times because they're a sponsor here, but I'll give you another, uh, an another, and I'll be pretty easy on them. This is factual, okay? The Tampa Bay Times, since inception, and it's been around for over 100 years, has never, underscore the word never, endorsed a Republican for President of the United States or Governor of, state, of the state of Florida in over 100 years, okay? They, I mean, you know how that bad that is? They endorsed Michael Dukakis, okay? My Republican friends think that's funny. Uh, <laughs> now look, you can argue legitimately, well, there's separation between the editorial page and the news. Okay, and that I generally accept that to be true. However, what I generally accept to be true and what the public believes and perceives are completely different. And the public views something like that, a factual statement like that, and they go, wow, yeah, I don't believe anything that I read in the Tampa Bay Times. 
And so when people like the president question the news media, and I'm not sure he's ever singled out the Tampa Bay Times, but when people become aware of things like that, facts like that, and then it's pointed out to them or questioned that it's legitimacy, that it's news gathering and his news operation is fake, it lends to have some credibility to it. Another problem with the news media is they've been cutting back. It's hard economic times. And that cutting back has resulted in less product, right? The Tampa Bay Times, prior to purchasing the Tampa Tribune, they used to have competition between them. Who's going to get the story, the scoop first? Reporters are naturally lazy. Uh, when you take out the element of competition with that crosstown newspaper, uh, they get even lazier. And so you don't see the scoops. You don't see the, the types of um, aggressive reporting that we used to see. And it's a real loss to our community. Uh, but we've got to demand better when you renew. You know, you tell your local paper, we want to see more news. We subscribe to the newspaper for news. It seems completely against the, the grain of logical thinking that a newspaper would cut back on its primary product, which is news in tough economic times. Uh, I was asked to give my opinion on why don't conservatives trust the mainstream media, and I think I've I pretty much answered that. I wanted to give another example, though, and tell me how much time I have left, because I don't want to go too long here to have room for more questions for uh, the whole panel. Um, <clears throat> the day that the Iran nuclear deal, that Trump announced that he was killing it, I watched, I think it was NBC Nightly News, but it, it might have been CBS. The reporter in presenting her, it was a female, in presenting her report, she was reporting from somewhere over in the Middle East, and she said, all the reasons why it was a bad thing that President Trump did not, or that he killed the Iran nuclear deal. Here are all the reasons why it's a bad thing. And I was watching it, I was watching it with my wife, who's pretty moderate, moderate left-leaning. She was watching it and had the exact same reaction that I did, which was, why didn't she say a single thing about why the president killed the Iran nuclear deal? What were the reasons for it? What were the good reasons, U.S. economic reasons, military reasons, et cetera, for killing that deal? And she didn't do it. So you watch something like that, and then you hear the president a couple days later talking about, yeah, the fake news media, and he's usually a little bit bold and over the top and all that kind of thing. But it does lend over time, you know, it just kind of trickles, right? And you do begin to have this whole sense of, I don't believe what I'm seeing, and look at what we're up against. And if you're not a conservative, if you're more on the left, and you are angry at conservatives, I can just, for, for what they say or what they think or about in, talking about the news media and topics of the day, it's because a lot of us really do feel like the media, that we just can't get a fair shake, okay? And I think part of having some sort of uh, reasonable understanding and uh, potential for solutions to problems facing our country begin with trying to understand the other side. And I'm speaking as mostly as a conservative. I'm a fiscal conservative. I'm socially kind of moderate. But uh, from the standpoint of the news media, as someone who is a journalist, is active in the media, and an influencer, uh, I can tell you that I hear a lot from my listeners and my former readers and so on and so forth that, you know, the media just is not fair to conservatives. And I'll tell you this also, <clears throat> if you don't think this is true, my kind of shtick over the years has always been, um, you know, very critical of Republicans who strike columns and so forth and was more apt to be critical of Republicans than I was of Democrats. And that being because I am a Republican, I care more about where the Republicans are going and where they're going wrong. But nonetheless, uh, very critical of Republicans and, and have been known for that. I was critical of President Trump, wrote several columns for the Tribune that were very critical of him as a candidate, that he didn't stand for anything. Who the hell is he? He's not a conservative, he's not a liberal, he's just Trump. I ended up voting for Donald Trump. I pinched my nose. We won't get into all the politics of that, you know, Hillary and all that stuff, but I voted for Trump, I pinched my nose and I did it. I'm actually a bigger Trump supporter today than I was on November whatever, election day of 2016, more, more of a supporter today than I was two years ago for one very simple reason. I look at all this stuff and see and hear and feel mostly coming from the mainstream news media and I feel like it's a stacked deck. And I'm just telling you that until such time as the media recognizes that, 
it's going to continue to be a problem and this divisiveness in our country and in our communities and on social media is not going to end. It's just not. Um, one of the other things that I was asked was, um, where do you find truth in media today? And I think that's a pretty simple question. You've got to look outside of whatever traditional outlets that you're looking at, whether they be online, on television, the newspaper. You gotta look at the other side. To understand the other side and to find solutions to problems, you've gotta look at the other side and try to put your mind in their position and, and have that different viewpoint and perspective and, and try to come to some conclusions that we can all agree to. So if you're traditionally a CNN viewer, I'd encourage you to watch Fox you know, 10, 15% of the time. If you're a Fox guy or gal, watch MSNBC 10, 15, 20% of the time. Uh, same thing with you know, online. If you're a conservative and you only go to the Drudge Report for your news, check out the Huffington Post once in a while and vice versa to get a sense of what other people are saying. And to give you an analogy of what this uh, problem is, <laughs> the night of, uh, the day after the election rather, when Barack Obama defeated Mitt Romney, all my Republican friends were just in shock, probably the same way that a lot of Democrats were when Trump beat Hillary Clinton. But they're all in shock. And to a T, almost every single one of them would tell me, well, all my friends voted for Mitt Romney. And I'd look at him, I'd go, well, I'd size him up. I know who your friends are. And your friends don't represent America. So if you're not talking to the lady that bags your groceries at Publix or the gal that's behind the desk at your dentist's office or you know, whoever else, you get the picture. If you're not talking to people outside your own sphere of influence, your own little bubble of people you work with or you hang out with because they're friends with your kids and you know, on a bowling league or whatever, whatever inside your sphere of influence, at the country club, at church, at school, whatever. You gotta get outside of that to understand what other people are saying, just like you gotta do in looking for alternative viewpoints in the news, on television and online and in periodicals and journals and whatnot that you read. All right, I'm getting the, uh, the cut it off sign, so I will leave it at that and look forward to the question and answer session. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank everyone for those uh, opening remarks. Uh, uh, I would like to begin by ex expanding on what you just said about uh, fake news and Mr. Trump not being responsible for, for it. I agree that he is not responsible as, uh, for uh, creating the actuality of fake news, because we saw, you, you, uh, you mentioned uh, the slide that 1830, a newspaper invented this uh, story about a colony on Mars of bat, bat humans. And that it wasn't actually, real? It actually goes back in, as far back as Egypt. They, one of the, the uh, generals was putting out fake stories about uh, the results of a battle that were exaggerated and false. But President Trump is, I, in my opinion, responsible for making the term fake news uh, invade every aspect of public reporting to the point that um, people have lost trust in basic news reporting. That's what I'd like to throw out for discussion. Well, I, I certainly see that Trump says and does a lot of things that make me cringe sometime. Um, I think, unfortunately, the media, again, is partly responsible for giving him the attention that perhaps he doesn't deserve. His tweets in particular, I'm always kind of perplexed and turned off by his tweets from time to time, more so than things that he actually says. And I thought about it, and it's kind of analogous to, if you ever had one of those laser pointers and if you have a cat and you turn that laser pointer on and you put it on the ground and you're running up the wall and over across the sofa and the cat chases it like it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill itself trying to catch this laser that it's never going to be able to catch. Is it, you ever get with the picture I'm presenting here? The news media is kind of like a cat and Donald Trump is the guy with the laser pointer. And every time he tweets, it's a laser pointer and the media is just jumping up and down over the wall, across the sofa 
and they're just so fixated on the last stupid thing that he said on Twitter and they're missing the opportunity to do real journalism, whether it's investigating the president and, and giving uh, him the, the real once-over that he needs, oh, as opposed to just focusing on you know, whatever dumb thing he said about Stormy Daniels yesterday. Well, he is the president, so we, the, the media can't ignore him. Yeah. Uh, Alexios, can you, can you react to um, that? Yeah, I mean, I'll say a couple of things. I, I think the, we need to look at economic incentives. I, I agree with that. But in any uh, economics classroom, you know that there is supply and demand, right? And so that part of the problem is not just uh, that the supply is of a certain type, but that also the demand hasn't been there or that the demand has been for shouty opinion uh, uh, TV and cable news rather than the investigative work. Let me give you a very much a for instance. A um, couple of weeks ago now, I think, I can't, time now is, uh, uh, my, I have an 11 month old daughter, so time is very much uh, um, But a couple of weeks now, uh, uh, the New York Times did break an enormous investigation, to your point, on President Trump and how uh, he uh, gained his riches and what kind of uh, about turns that both his father and him had done to evade uh, taxes in a way that uh, very much seems um, uh, out of, at least out of the norm, if not out of the law. Three reporters, of which one worked exclusively on that for a year and a half, Right. That's a lot of time to put one of your best reporters on. Um, and yet, after a couple of days, that wasn't even in the news anymore, in good part because we were all frenzied up in the Kavana hearings and uh, what he said and who was fair and who was not fair and whose side we were on. So I think we need to temper a little bit this vision that investigative reporting isn't happening. It is happening. Uh, it is sometimes affecting change, as with the Times is reporting on the failure factories or on mental health uh, institutes across the Tampa Bay um, uh, area. Um, but the flip side is the audiences need to be there for it. And I'd like to comment on, on that, uh, what you said about Trump. In the terms of the report from the New York Times that really didn't get a whole lot of, I mean, it was a two-day story, and then everyone moved on to the next thing. And we see this happening time and again with President Trump. And the problem is, is that he really, I think he is so masterful in his manipulation of the media. If you think about it for a minute, what's the one thing, the, the, the worst thing that you can think of in his eight years in office that President Clinton did? You don't have to answer it, it's rhetorical, but I think we all know what it is. It had to do with Monica Lewinsky, right? What's the one worst thing that Donald Trump has done since he's been in office in two years? I guarantee every single one of you has a different answer to that question. Okay, it's, it's a rhetorical question. I guarantee every one of you, though, has a different answer. And the point being that it's almost become so commonplace for Trump to do something that's just absolutely, seemingly absurd, that he's almost immune to the criticism because it's like, well, sure, I'm upset about what he said today, but no more than I was upset about what he said yesterday. And it's, it's really, I think, almost masterful in a Machiavellian manipulative sense that John? he has been able to manage the news media and the public in the way that he has. John, do you uh, think that, uh, uh, do you agree with, with uh, Chris's point? Well, you know what I was thinking? Uh, f first of all, he's very good at using Twitter, right? But please don't blame the technologists. Uh, uh, <laughs> but he, he's really made great use of that. But and, you know what I was thinking? This may be an odd example, but uh, you know, I played a lot of basketball. and. Um, if you play really close defense, the, the referees are kind of used to calling a certain number of fouls. You know, they, they know when they're calling more or less than the normal. And if you play really close defense, after a while, you get away with more than you normally would. And I think it's, that, for whatever it's worth, that's what I was thinking. They, you know, you play that tough, close defense, you're in somebody's face the whole game, and the referees tend to start to let it go a little bit, and you get away with things that are just, you know, no autopsy, no foul kind of thing. Uh, and, and that's somewhat the principle that was going through my mind, so. Well, um, I, also, I think in large part, the internet has created the, the atmosphere or the culture for this to happen. 
because like you, I was in the business of publishing opinions daily. I did that for 30 years. And, but I worked for a newspaper where there were people who checked the accuracy, factuality, and grammar of everything that went in there. They were called editors. <laughs> the internet doesn't have those. And that is why anybody can say almost anything. Do, do either of any of you foresee a day when the internet might have something equivalent to an editor that would prevent crazy people from, uh, or dishonest people from posting lies? Alexios? Um, so I, I think as the, as the millennial on the panel, I, I should probably also defend the internet a little bit. Um, because uh, in its defense, um, I think sometimes this discussion also needs to be done on a global perspective, right? In the United States, you do have a history, at least over the past 50 years, of investment in uh, media organizations that had, uh, to some extent, a commitment to fact-checking before publishing. Uh, that wasn't the case all over the world, right? And so the internet allowed, in many places, um, the independent media organizations to emerge outside of government-controlled press, outside of, of that type of uh, regime. That's how I got into the business in Italy, for one. Um, your question was, will the internet have editors? Uh, the major platform's uh, uh, mantra has been over the past uh, few years, we are not publishers, we are not publishers, we are not publishers, right? That they view themselves as if uh, they were newsstands, right? Not news publishers. I, obviously that analogy doesn't hold because it's, uh, if Facebook was a newsstand, it was a newsstand where if you once looked at the National Enquirer, next time the full stand is National Enquirer, and then the next time still you're like drowning in Enquirer. So um, it's not the same system, it's not the same, it doesn't work that way. They are working on, so Facebook for instance, I alluded to it earlier, has partnered with fact checkers so that if users have flagged potentially false stories as such, and fact checkers flag them as, as, uh, as false, you can see below that link, you can see uh, the link to the fact check. So I, I, what I envision is that more and more uh, uh, platforms are going to find ways to provide more context and more information uh, to complete something uh, rather than to prevent. Part of this is also scale and numbers, right? How is Facebook, I can't remember what the latest number is, but really like millions of posts uh, in very short amount of time. You're not going to be able to post everything. What they need to be doing is um, making sure that the virality component, the stuff that reaches hundreds of thousands and millions, that on that there is some control and some uh, annotation. John, uh, in that regard, would changing the monetization of, of uh, po po the way p posts are rewarded money-wise, would changing that uh, prevent some of this? And tell, tell us, how, how do I make money if I want to uh, earn some money by posting things? How many does it take? Well, uh, that's a good question, and, and uh, it takes a lot. Uh, it takes an awful lot, but again, that, you're, there's, a, there's an incentive to do so. And so you're finding um, f uh, there's at least one case of where, where there are influencers uh, children who view toys or open new toys on YouTube and they end up getting lots of traffic, hundreds of thousands and, and even millions of, of, of uh, views. And they're rewarded for that. Uh, the, the platforms have created an incentive. Google has an AdSense program that will incent you for traffic. If you draw uh, traffic to your site, you can be rewarded for that. So I don't know what the numbers are, what the thresholds are, but you're, you know, you're paid fractions of a cent for, for views or links. So um, you've got to generate quite a bit of traffic. But parents, as it turned out, were buying views and buying likes and driving up the, the traffic for uh, some of those sites. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously a, a something that can be done, but it will probably eventually be, be discovered if the, if the traffic isn't valid, if you're generating it yourself as was done in Macedonia. Chris, is there uh, something more that the major social media companies like Facebook and so forth can or should be doing to regulate 
uh, fake sites? You know, I think that probably the media, if the media would focus on just doing a better job, then people wouldn't look for these alternative sites. I think that the social media companies, I recognize it's a private company and you have basically a contract with them that says they own whatever you, and they could do whatever the hell they want with your account. Uh, so there's no free speech component, but I absolutely hate the what I think amounts to censorship that we're seeing on a lot of these social media platforms. For example, there was this uh, professor at, I, I think she was at Georgetown or George Washington University after the Kavanaugh hearings that called for the castration of several members of, of the Republican senators on the Judiciary Committee and that they their bodies should be fed alive to dogs or wolves or something. And, I mean, it was offensive, but... I want to know that people are saying that, right? I want to know who this woman is. I want to know when my kid is ready to go to college, maybe I don't want to send her there. And on the flip side, you know, you've got some of these crazies on the right, like Alex Jones. He's saying all this nutcase stuff. They've kicked him off. But I like the fact that we can hear these whack jobs and we can say, hey, you know what? They are so far out there. Maybe the stuff that I'm seeing on the more mainstream news media, albeit is a little bit biased and not completely objective, but... It's a lot better than the alternative on the left and the Chris, right. Chris, there's a substantial p percentage of the population believe Alex Jones's outrageous stories. Well, and, you, and You can't fix stupid. Well. <laughs> it, it never have and never will. <laughs> you know, one of the things, David, that um, I, I was thinking, you know, the, what concerns me is it often we don't realize how much we're being influenced and, uh, and how much of our behavior is tracked and how what we're seeing has been selected for us. And I think that's, that's a concerning factor. So Chris's point about looking at alternative sources, I, when I was in college many years ago, the comedian Dick Gregory spoke. And I don't remember too much about what he said, but the, one of the last things he said was, you need to find ways to inform yourself. And that stuck with me. I don't know why, because I wasn't really that bright or interested in the time. It was just something to do. But it stuck with me, and I think that applies now. And to realize we're being influenced when we, you know, obviously you see that with the ads that are served, but that extends to, at times to the information that you're seeing as well. And it's good to be aware of that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question that gets into a very... A deep area, and, and perhaps the audience will have some more on this, but uh, there I have seen many allusions to the impact of this fake news and this distrust of information leading to the decline of democracy uh, and the, really the suppression of truth uh, all over, in, including in Europe. Alexios, you may have something to say on this. Do you think that this phenomena could lead to um, the death of our democracy? The Atlantic's uh, October issues was devoted to the question, is democracy dying? And they focused on Poland, which has gone right wing and has, has become a one party, pretty much a one party state, and truth is being suppressed. So I'm gonna throw that out. Um, Alexios, what do you hear in your uh, fact-finding in, in Europe with, with the European Union organization? I, I mean, I think my concern is that we are in a very tricky situation and we bundle up a lot of different problems. Um, what is true in Poland and is true here um, is there's an enormous polarization of society. Um, and that's, I think, a different problem from how our informa major information platforms are structured. Uh, and that's a different problem still from um, do we have a, a good and healthy media ecosystem with the right uh, business models that will make it sustainable, um, and so on and so on. And so I think, uh, for my part, I have a very narrow concentration on, on like, can we make sure we have um, information ecosystems that it, to the extent possible, promote and encourage accurate information. Um, I think we're working on that. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think actually bundling, like the Atlantic did, all of these things together uh, makes us get, makes the problem seem so much more daunting um, that ultimately it leads us to powerlessness and feeling like we can't actually fix it. Chris? 
I don't think democracy is dead. I think, if anything, what we've seen over the course of the last year as a result of Trump and, and people's unease with Trump or their sycophant type of uh, love of Trump on the other side has actually caused more people to be engaged. For all the faults of the social media and the World Wide Web, the amount of information that's available to us on our phones today is just phenomenal. And the ability for every individual to express themselves. I mean, you want to talk about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech has never been greater in probably anywhere in the world than it is in the United States today. And I think that's a good thing. I think, if anything, what we really need to focus on is the consolidation of these media conglomerates, whether it's Facebook or if it's the Alphabet Networks or, or other media that really control 95% of what we receive. It's that 5% and the, the fringe elements within that 5% that get all the salacious attention that makes us think that the sky is falling. But I, I really, I don't have a problem with that. I think that people just need to see it for what it is. And the bigger concern is the consolidation of media in this country. John? Well, I, I would say, you know, the line in the sand for me would be uh, if, if the government were to try to take control of the distri distribution mechanisms. Uh, when I was at Eckert, we sent a lot of students to China. Uh, on study abroad trips. And um, I was instrumental in bringing Google onto campus to be our email system, uh, Google Apps. So any of you have an account there and aren't happy, I was the guy. Uh, <laughs> but guess what? When they went to China, the Chinese government did not uh, allow them to access Google. But I will also say, we found ways for it to work. You know, students would we we show them how to use a VPN, and they were able to get around the controls. But that would be the line in the sand for me. I think there's a lot of information available, and and who's generating that content is one thing, but controlling the means of distribution is quite another issue. And that would be the line in the sand for me that would concern me greatly. And maybe that's happening, and I don't know, but but that well, would be I, the issue. Well, I think really it is happening. Um, to your point. Um, the internet was largely credited with generating the Arab Spring in 2011 because so many people had this in information and this ability to communicate. But it has now been suppressed in some of those very countries, and the government does control what goes on it. Isn't that true? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah, my line was in the U.S., I guess. But, oh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I think you're it's exactly right. All right. Uh, Jacqueline and Sharon are going to be going around with mics. We'll try to get to your questions. We won't get to all of them, I'm sure. But wait for the mic to get, a, because we're recording this, and we want to have your question on uh, recorded. The gentleman in yellow. Thank you so much. Am I on? It's on. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sure we all appreciate the tremendous amount of talent, journalistic talent on the uh, stage this evening. I, th I think uh, Chris has been a little tough on the liberal side of the media, but that's just my opinion. And, uh, but I was disappointed in Alexius um, uh, when he was asked the question about investigative uh, journalism, and he blamed it essentially on the news consumer. There's not enough demand or interest, he said, uh, to justify journalism to do an investigative deep dive stories. And so I'd like to push Alexius a little bit on this issue. Can you identify anything that kind of the institutional media, you being from Pointer, uh, has responsibility for and the lack of trust, which is what David introduced in his first question, that the public has, or some of the public has, in the media. Who's, who's that for? Uh, Who wants, Alexios? Yeah, we'll sure, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I, w I think I was soft on, on the media. I think you uh, missed a good part of uh, my introductory remarks where I said that it needs to commit to being more accurate, it needs to commit to having more fact checkers on staff, it needs to commit to correcting more promptly. Those are all things that need to be uh, at the core of um, how any reputable media organization does, the, does their job. I'm in no way interested in a corporatist approach here. I came into this business not as a journalist. I still barely consider myself a journalist. Um, I just think uh, that there's uh, there's a lot of blaming others these days. 
um, and uh, uh, we need to all look at ourselves as well as a part of the problem. And for sure, working journalists have been part of the problem, um, but our own attitude to what information we want has been part of the problem too. And I would like to add in uh, defense of journalism and even mainstream media, these are all primarily for-profit corporations. So if they're cutting back on things like investigative journalism, it is in large part because that's not what people want. It's not what they're demanding. Uh, you look at the local television as another example of how bad news is on local television. You watch it in the morning, and it's the biggest bunch of nonsense. Between the weather and maybe the top story, there's nothing worth, worth watching. They show things like stupid pet tricks and what's trending on Facebook. If I wanted, to, if I wanted that, I'd look at Facebook. It's not news. And so for whether it's a newspaper or whether it's uh, something on television, they're responding to what consumers want. And if you don't like what you're seeing, you need, at some level need to make your voice heard. Probably the easiest way to do that is to subscribe to a newspaper and watch the television and you know, be picked up on the ratings. And if you want real news, look for real news. Don't watch anything on the Alphabet Networks. I think probably the best news on television today is probably at PBS or the BBC, and, and they, they will eventually get the message. It'll, they're really slow learners because they think they know every damn thing in the world, but eventually the accountants are going to catch up with the corporate bigwigs, and they're going to point this out to them, and things will change. All right. Uh, Sharon? Um, this is about the, the, the title here is about fake news, but we've gone into mainstream media about some of the shortfalls there. Now, you know, fake news is still difficult to suss out as I'd forgotten the, the guy that they cut off Twitter who was the conservative goofball, yeah. Um, so, but with the mainstream media, it seems like when the 24-hour news cycle came in, there's a breaking news and there's, this is what happened and there's then three hours of speculation because nobody has any real information. Um, and the newspapers, uh, regarding the New York Times article, uh, New York Times also did one on Jared Kushner recently, that was innuendo. Now, what Jared Kushner does with his money has been, been, doing, been done for uh, you know, years. And it was an innuendo that this guy is evil because he hasn't paid taxes, yet everybody in this room would love not to do that. Um, so, the, but, you know, the... the What's the question? <laughs> the, well, the question then comes is, what's the solution for the uh, news as opinion, not only as fake news, but in mainstream uh, stream news? Because that's what was alluded to here. It, news is no longer news. I do remember a time when news was fair and balanced. Uh, wh how, what's the solution to news as opinion? Wow, I think we're all kind of at a loss. I, I really don't know. I, I think it really comes down to the market and what consumers demand. And I think that a lot of people, they really enjoy watching the, you know, MSNBC or Fox and these talking heads just argue incessantly over nonsense. And that's what the consumer wants, or at least that's perceived to be what they want. And so that's what we're getting. If you don't like that and you want to see real news, turn that crap off. That's all I could tell you. Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer to that question, but I think part of the dilemma is it's, it's a bandwidth issue. We've got so much bandwidth, so many channels that we need content, and, and I think that's part of it. I don't, I don't know that I'm arguing to restrict the bandwidth, but we're, we're filling airtime to some extent, I think. Uh, is there a market for a, a very clever entrepreneur to create an outlet that provides the kind of Legitimate news we're hoping for, Chris or Alexios? Yeah, I, I think there is. I think that it's going to take a lot of money because there's so much other noise and you're competing against already established channels uh, and other entities. But I, I think that there's definitely that opportunity, particularly, again, I go back to if that's what the public demands, if that's what the market dictates. I've seen a site, you may know what it is, that purports to share stories that have been vetted but its name escapes me right now. Newsy is now. Newsy. 
Is that okay? I, I, I've just read a little bit about that recently, I, uh, but I don't know much about them. There, I mean, yeah, there is absolutely a market. Uh, you know, uh, ProPublica is like uh, a website that does only and exclusively in, in investigative reporting, and it's uh, it's grown in memberships. And you, I was surprised to to hear that you found the New York Times report on uh, President Trump's taxes uh, innuendo because I found it uh, have carry okay. Um, but uh, I, so I don't get why the two were bundled then. But uh, uh, the New York Times' subscription numbers have been out of the roof uh, uh, digitally. Um, the in the area, uh, Politifact uh, uh, is a fact-checking website that uh, raised uh, the. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars within the first few months from members. So I think there is a very much a thirst for this uh, type of uh, work. Uh, Newsly that you mentioned is a partnership with PolitiFact, actually. Right. On this side, Jacqueline. Oh. No? Sharon, do you have one? There's one. Hello? I'm wondering uh, how many of you would advocate bringing back the fairness doctrine, the equal time rule that was eliminated in 1987 um, by the FCC and is somehow connected to the birth of the cable industry and all the talk shows that we hear about uh, or hear on our radio that are very much geared to a particular audience. Um, that's when I, as a consumer of news, I'm 57, so I grew up on Vietnam on, at night and all kinds of things like that. And what I noticed during that time was the corporatization of many of my local news organizations. Um, and I remember Bill O'Reilly when he was on Channel 5 News on WCVB in Boston. And he was, he, was, he was bloviating then. Um, but um, that's when I saw the shift and um, went the birth of the cable industry and tons of, tons of so-called news. And I think the deregulation, I don't know, my opinion may have something to do with it. I don't know. What's your opinion? I would love uh, to see it come back. Yes. I, I actually don't. I am pretty against regulation of the news media. Uh, I know for my own, well, you know what though, there's equal time when the market pre prevents, presents something that people demand, and if there was a demand, for example, for liberal talk radio, liberal talk radio would exist. Every time it's been tried, it pretty much fails. Uh, but I would just say that if you're looking for that alternative viewpoint, change the channel and go somewhere else. I mean, you can find both sides. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, well, we can't address everyone's unique situation, but my point being, there are plenty of things out there, whether it's on cable television or whether it's on the internet, that you can seek alternative viewpoints. The government doesn't need to be demanding and dictating to various outlets that you have to cover six minutes of this candidate and six minutes of that candidate and this issue and that issue. I just don't think that's the free market that uh, our country is built upon, and, and I would reject that, and I think that you can find what you're looking for for alternative viewpoints. You just, you know, it, it has to be up to you to, to want to do it. We need to have a microphone. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. Let's get a new question from uh, this side of the room. Is anybody over there? Sharon? There you go. Thank you. If you could share with us, and maybe the audience knows some of the newspapers and fact checkers uh, organizations that you guys would recommend on both sides of or, or multi, you know, um, points of view, because I think that's important. I think not everyone knows where to go for the fact checking or which newspapers. You know, I happen to be a PVS and you know WEDU fan, but 
Maybe some other people want to know other um, newspapers that they feel are well, neutral. Well, uh, Alexios, you're in the fact-checking business. What would yeah, you say? Yeah, and we actually uh, have a code of principles that um, we require fact-checkers, we require, we open up to fact-checkers to apply to, um, that requires that they list their funding, that requires they list who their authors are, that requires that it, it, they explain their methodology, that requires that they have a public corrections policy. There's 12 requirements, uh, they apply, that gets sent to an external journalism expert who then sends to our board an assessment of whether they meet those requirements and uh, that's an annual process. So I can tell you that for the United States, uh, the organizations that currently are verified uh, include the AP's fact check uh, uh, project, uh, PolitiFact, um, Snopes, uh, factcheck.org, um, and uh, uh, the fact check column at the Weekly Standard. Um, so these are the currently the five projects that. Are they, the is there a place projects. where they post that this? Each yeah, each on on their uh, on their fact checking. So if I centers. if I go there, I'll I can see that they they're, regularly they're publish certified. Fact checks. Yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to yeah. Yeah, I would say I uh, I read the Wall Street Journal, subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. I get the Sunday New York Times. I get the digital version of the New York Times. Uh, I also get the local newspaper. I used to get both local newspapers. And I like uh, the BBC. I like Al Jazeera, although I don't think I get that on my cable system anymore. Um, and also PBS uh, for television. I think that those are all good. And also the, the wire services, AP, Reuters, et cetera. They do a pretty good job. Uh, but really, you know, just, just look around. I mean, it, it's really not that hard to find those alternative viewpoints. And I'll tell you... I don't watch cable television uh, news. I don't watch O'Reilly Factor. I don't watch Rachel Maddow. This stuff is just mind-bogglingly ridiculous and stupid to me. Uh, and, and I don't really want that kind of anxiety. It, it makes my blood pressure rise watching that stuff. Whether it's on the left or on the right, I don't think it's healthy. So give that stuff up and go look for real news. Because if you think you're a news junkie by watching the O'Reilly Factor or Rachel Maddow, or whatever else is in between, you're not. You're not a news junkie. I don't know what you are, but you are not a news junkie. John, do you have any uh, favorite to recommend for accuracy? Uh, not, I, don't, I don't think I could offer anything because I look at all these technical sites all the time, and they're always true, so. Okay. David, can I? David. Yeah, hi. Um, we have a president in... It's on. We have a president in office who did not get uh, three million votes more than the person he ran against. So the popular vote did not uh, win the election. So my question is, how has technology uh, fixed or changed the electoral college where with technology can now pinpoint you know, 400 people in a cabin somewhere who thinks a certain way and we can get those votes and polling has done something a certain way. All of this is the result, I think, of, of technology that maybe our forefathers didn't think about. And what effect has the electoral college may not be a positive or a fair method now that technology is such a force? Well, you know, I, it seems to me that, you know, some, some of that information was available in the last election but wasn't used or acted upon. It wasn't, wasn't believed, perhaps, in some areas. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, think, I think it's, it's uh, that technology is, if you're talking about technology in terms of, of providing information about groups of people. It, it's talking about pinpointing people uh, using data and mm -hmm. pinpointing a certain segment to win an election, not necessarily by a popular vote. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would just add, uh, with regard to the, the question as it relates to the Electoral College, look, two years ago, both sides knew what the rules were. It wasn't get the most votes, it was get to 270, okay? So the fact that certain precincts or what have you can be targeted, that's also technology that's available to both sides. Hillary Clinton, in my opinion, ran a terrible campaign. That's why Donald Trump is the president today, she knew what the rules were. She knew that she needed to get 270. And the fact that she didn't spend enough time in the Rust Belt is the reason why she's not the president Donald Trump is. I do think micro-targeting is uh, a concern. 
Um, I think actually in the past couple of years though, it's a concern because we don't know it's happening, right? Like that's where the concern arises. Um, that you don't know that you're being served as something that only you as a white gentleman of a certain age has seen, but actually your neighbor uh, of maybe a different race or a different age is, is uh, no idea that it's even out there. So that, that that content can't be verified or fact-checked or debunked. That's where the concern is. I don't think that the targeting or catering to individual voters is a problem. So over the past couple of years, there has been progress on that. We have pushed Facebook, uh, so the ad archive that uh, David mentioned earlier uh, does get around this a little bit in the sense that paid and promoted content uh, for political purposes needs to be listed and you can find whether this has happened. So there's been some progress on that. Now I would caution against uh, uh, presuming that because micro-targeting happened, um, that was able to swing elections, right? We know that you know, decades of uh, uh, socio sociology uh, uh, teaches us that it's really quite hard to determine what makes a person vote one way or the other. Um, and so I don't know, even though we do know that there has there had been uh, targeting, including of the IRA in, so the in Internet Research Agency in significant districts, we, uh, just because it happened, we can't tell that that was a significant factor in making people vote one way or the other. Uh, and I doubt, honestly, I doubt it. I doubt that we can make that decision yet. Uh, but that doesn't remove from the fact that we should know that it's happening and we should have the resources to uh, correct it, fact check it, verify it, rebut it. I think that's a really good point. And, and I think we've learned the, the value in large data sets and, and the value we can extract from large data sets. Cambridge Analytica is an example. They, they were able to use large data sets that uh, maybe we might argue whether they should have had access to those or not, but the algorithms that are being developed that allow us to, to cr find relationships in data sets that, that we didn't know existed. Uh, I think we'll see that continue. Okay, let's go to the back of the room, Sharon. Hello, I'm a um, public policy student here at SPC and I'm actually taking mass media and public policy currently and this is my class for the night. Um, I, <laughs> I just wanted to get your opinion, especially you Chris, because um, you had said that you feel like the media is unfair to President Trump and I guess I'm just curious if it's not the media's job to fact check the President of the United States, whose job is it to fact check a president who has, who has told almost 5,000 lies, verifiable lies, since taking office. If it's not the media's job to tell the truth when the president won't, I want to know who, whose job do you think it is? Um, fair question, uh, but I would also point out, newsflash, politicians lying to you is not a unique phenomenon to Donald Trump. Okay. And, you know, you're holding up your sign that says Trump lies. Uh, Obama lied. President Bush lied. President Clinton lied. They're politicians. They lie to you. I've been working in politics professionally for 23 and a half years. I can tell you, politicians lie. And if you don't accept and understand that, you're fooling yourself. Now, are there different degrees of liars? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And I hear you all grumbling out there, and you don't like hearing what I'm telling you, but this is part of the problem that we're facing in our society. The unwillingness, the willful rejection of fact and acknowledgement of certain things to include all politicians, including Bill and Hillary Clinton and Ronald Reagan and George Bush and Donald Trump. He's a doozy of a liar. But if you don't accept that the person that you voted for is also complicit in this culture of politics and lying... You're fooling yourself, and we're don't, never going to be able to come to reasonable conclusions. Don't you think that it has gotten uh, exponentially worse since 2016? Yeah, I think, sure, sure, I do. And, and I don't condone President Trump's behavior. I think I, I made that clear earlier, but I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. We need a microphone. We can't hear you. You said that you support him more now than the day you voted for him in 2016. Right. So you, 
you say on the one hand that you don't condone his actions, but yet you support him more now than the day you voted right. for him. And, and here's his why. behavior over the course of his two years in office has, has shown that he doesn't represent the United States in a way that projects confidence and strength to the rest of the world. So I would like to know what has made you more supportive of him now than when you voted for him in 2016. Because, because this, is, this is my opinion, okay? And I know a lot of you are going to go, oh, you know, disagree. In my opinion, he's done a hell of a job as president as it relates to things like jobs and the economy and, and world affairs, okay? Okay, laugh and disagree with me all you want. You ask the question, you ask for my opinion, I'm giving it to you, and I would appreciate the courtesy of le letting me answer the question, okay? The president has done a lot of things that are embarrassing. I admit that, okay? We've had other presidents that have done things that are embarrassing. And if we don't acknowledge that, we're fooling ourselves. But I think, my opinion, he's done a good job managing our country. You can disagree with me on that. You can disagree with me on that, okay? She asked the question, I'm answering the question, ma'am. Okay, let's get, let's get a different issue. Jacqueline has a question. In the middle. Uh, yeah, um, I have a question. As happens often during these kinds of events, uh, the topic seems to devolve into politics. But this kind of topic affects almost every decision we make in life, not just political. With that said, what recommendations would you give for us to teach our children how to become better consumers of the news? Thank, thank That's you. That's a good question. Can I? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, and yes, like the one of the major problems is how can we reach information that we can make accurate and in decisions in our everyday life? Let me give you a for instance. I mentioned a moment ago I have an 11-month-old daughter. When my wife was pregnant at the beginning we weren't sure what she could and couldn't eat if you were googling something you know can a pregnant woman eat cilantro and we were at a taco place uh, and the the top results were hell no it's gonna kill the baby it's gonna kill the mother it'll kill everyone around you at a one mile radius so we need we, we need to be talking about how to rewire our information platforms so that what rises up is not what has been most linked to, what has been most common to, but what comes from uh, uh, the most reliable sources. So, in an answer to your question, um, first, all we, and these are all, none of this is rocket science, right? Like, so much of this is just basic common sense. Go beyond the, the title go beyond the, the content of the post and open up whatever link has been brought to you or sent to you. We, we have studies that 60% of links on Twitter are retweeted or shared without being opened, okay? Um, so, number one. Number two, look at what evidence is provided to you, right? Uh, see if that source is actually offering backup uh, for what they're saying or if it's just uh, the content itself. There are basic... Uh, technological tips, the uh, technological tips, uh, basic verification tips, like the one I mentioned before of reverse searching an image uh, to see whether it has been used or misused in other contexts. During the hurricanes, uh, routinely, I don't, how many of you guys saw there was a picture of a shark uh, on an interstate? Uh, yeah. The shark, well, well, yeah, there was also a Sharknado, but that's not it. Um, but anyway, there, this photo keeps resurfacing, resurfacing, and it's always fake, and it's always a doctored photo. And so uh, a lot of the times, the weakest link in a false story is the image um, because it is being reused or, or researched in that way. Find other sources in that uh, sphere that are reliable. If it's health, go to the CDC. Don't presume that the top... 10 results on Google are the top 10 by credibility. They're not going to be necessarily. So, is it? It increasingly is. Yeah. It's, on this subject, isn't there a need to teach our children social media literacy? And isn't Pointer working in that area? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, the, the risk of being digitally native but digitally naive is a serious one. Now, at the same time, uh, uh, 
just a few days ago, Pew found that uh, uh, those uh, Americans aged uh, 50 and above were worse than Americans aged 18 to 49 in uh, detecting the difference between fact and opinion. So I think this is something that has, like everyone needs to get better at this. At the Pointer Institute, we, uh, so we host International Fact Checking Day on April 2nd. Um, the day after April Fool's Day. Um, <laughs> if you go on factcheckingday.com, there are tip sheets for how to use various social media and how to find better information on, and how to debunk content on social media. There's a fake news quiz. There is a lesson plan for high school teachers modeled around a newsroom. It's a card game. Um, last year, we reached more than 100,000 students in 30 countries. So uh, absolutely, there is work to be done. Uh, we need to do better. Uh, and it's got to be a proactive, more general, because this is what happens over and over again. If we make fake news about politics or about um, Trump, then we're, we're going to be brawling. Uh, if we make combating fake news about the fact that we need the right information to go about our, in our everyday lives, then I think we all can agree on that. Then I think we can all agree that no one wants to get fooled. So let's start on that proactive side. Thank you very much for your question. There's, there's also an organization called The Lamp. Um, my son's on the board of the New York chapter, and, the, and the, their mission is digital literacy, and I believe they have resources as well that, that might be helpful. It's called The Lamp. L-A-M-P. You know, one of the problems with fewer people reading newspapers is they don't get that broad overview of what's going on in the world and in their community. When you go to a website, you tend to gravitate toward websites that just reinforce your own interest in whatever news that you're looking for, and you don't get that broad picture. One of the things that I do to answer the question about our kids, I have three kids. They're 14 and twins that are 11. And every weekend on Sundays usually, I take the front page of the Tampa Bay Times or the local section of the Tampa Bay Times and I say, look at these and find me a story and then tell me about it. And it forces them to actually look at the paper and go, th go through the newspaper and see and then pick out something that they're interested in. And I really don't care what their little report is on what they read. I'm just more in trying to engage them into exploring a newspaper, which probably won't be around 10 years from now in terms of you know the actual hard copy delivered paper. But uh, with most newspaper websites, they don't give you that same type of opportunity to interact or to, to explore different things. And, and I think the New York Times is a, a rare exception. It's an exceptional uh, website, but my kids are still a little too young to say, go read the New York Times, but uh, that's what I do. Well, if only m there were more parents like this who did take the time to help their children understand what's going on, that would, we wouldn't have as big a problem as we do, I think. Is there a question on the left here? With the uh, upcoming election, and the election in 2020, with this wonderful movement that we have been hearing about with women getting active in politics, and the large turnout, which I think we ex will expect to see in November, what is your opinion on how do you think it will affect our governing? In terms of if there's a, a large turnout, primarily of women, uh, am I, is it reasonable to assume you mean a, a blue wave? Pardon me? Just a large turnout. And traditionally in elections, if there's a large turnout, it tends to favor Democrats. So I think that you're basically alluding to if there's a blue wave. Uh, it, it will affect. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not rocket science. I tell you what I think is going to happen. I think the Republicans are probably going to pick up a couple of seats in the Senate, and I think they're going to lose the House. And that divided government seems to be something that most Americans like. And, and you know, the grand scheme of things in terms of uh, what most people want, I guess that's a good thing. Can, can I piggyback on that to ask, do you, are any of you uh, aware of how much Russia is trying to do to influence this election? No, and I don't really care. And I don't care from the standpoint of, no, just let me finish, okay? I don't care from the standpoint of there's not a whole lot we can do about it, and I'm a big believer in don't worry about things that you can't control. 
Um, our country has been involved in similar types of things in trying to influence other countries' elections. This goes on. It has gone on for a long time since the inception of the Internet. I think that the American people, I like to give them credit that they're sophisticated enough or more sophisticated than we tend to give them credit for. And I'm just, I'm not really concerned about it. I think that most people still get their news and their information from the primary source of television. And as far as I know, that has not been infiltrated by the Russians or any other foreign government. So I'm, I'm just, in the grand scheme of things, I'm not concerned. I don't mean to sound flippant about it. I mean, obviously, if there are things that are going on that are untoward toward our country, I'm concerned about it, but I just don't think that this has the gravity of concern that I think that has been played up to be. Even uh, hundreds of thousands of bots giving out false uh, impressions and information. John? Uh, there may be some influence, but I, I'm not sure that it, it changes a vote necessarily. Um, but there's a lot of activity. I don't know, if, has anyone read the Mueller indictments of the Russians? They were incredibly detailed, weren't they? Didn't it make you stop and think, how did we get that information? I mean, to the point where they were referencing specific searches done by specific people on certain days. Uh, so a little bit, I think part of that uh, purpose of the indictment was to demonstrate that um, you know, we have some capabilities ourselves. But it certainly is occurring, and, and I don't think there's, there's um, there, the platforms have tried to step up, take steps to, to, to reduce the, the amount of traffic, but it's, there's still evidence that it's occurring. But whether it's a linkage to voting, uh, it, may be a link, it may create an event, it may create uh, a confrontation, uh, but whether it changes votes is really a tough, tough thing to say, okay. but it's certainly happening. All right, uh, one last question, and we'll, we'll have to give it a the last night. last one, great. I'm not going to stand up. Um, uh, last fall, Neil deGrasse Tyson was here and talked about math literacy in this country. And earlier in the year, I saw a uh, literature professor that talked about the reading level in this country. When you talk about the American public has the ability to discern all this, our math literacy is 49 out of top 50 in industrial countries. And other than Facebook, most people only read nine minutes a day. I imagine most of the people in this room spend a lot more time than that reading, which means that most of those people in the country that get stuff, their news from Facebook, it's been modified by the Russians. Any one of you tell me how you think that they're gonna be able to discern what is fake news and what is real news? Who wants to take that? I don't know, I'm just, as I said before, I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about it because most people still get their news as it relates to politics and government from television. And as far as I know, Putin hasn't been able to manipulate CNN or Fox or NBC. So I'm, not, I'm just not real concerned about it. Anyone else? I would say it gets back to finding ways to inform ourselves and we need to rely on multiple sources. If you're getting all your information from one source, that may be an issue. I don't think all of the information on Facebook is influenced, but, uh, but I do think it's, it's valuable, to Chris's point earlier, to find alternate sources. A final word, Alexios? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that we could go longer. Many of you would want to, but some of you may need to get home, so I will have to end it here. But I would like to ask you to thank our panel for giving us so much information. And be before you go, first I would like to thank the uh, staff of the Institute, the technology staff uh, for their audiovisuals, the student volunteers, and the waiters. Thank you very much. And I'd like to call your attention to the next program in this dinner series. It will be in the new year, in January, at the end of January. It's another topic that is not unlike this one, the case for social democracy. Uh, I think this is just as weighty and just as um, intellectually challenging. I hope you'll come back for that. It's a dinner in this room on the 31st of January. And uh, for any of you who like to see students, uh, 
learning things on November 15th, we're having the finals of the great debate. That's a competition, debating competition for five of our campuses, and it will be at this campus in the UP building, Digitorium. It's free, it's in the middle of the day. Please come out and cheer on the students. And that's all, thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Good night. <laughs>